are about to see a China you haven't seen before through the eyes of an American broadcaster who knows China and her people as few others do. She is Yu Sai Khan, whose weekly TV series is seen by a staggering 400 million Chinese, making her a significant link between China and the outside world, and a household name in the country of her birth. In this uniquely personal journey, we'll visit Yusai's hometown of Weilin, where fishermen still use cormorants to land their catch. <laughs> Explore Shanghai's headlong rush into consumerism. Tune in with a billion Chinese for a close look at what they're watching on TV. Visit a health spa where the water and mud have legendary healing powers. Walk the Great Wall. Visit the tomb of China's first emperor. Get a rare glimpse of Mao Zedong's private residence and bundle up for some cold and colorful winter festivities. Now Yu Sai Khan will show you a new China few people really know. There are two very popular words in China these days, Kai Fang. Translated, they mean opening the door to the outside world. They signify a major change in direction for the Chinese, a strong desire to know more about others, and a warm welcome to foreigners to come in to get to know them better. I'm Yusai Khan. In the next hour, we'll look behind Kai Fang, that open door, on a very personal journey through a China I've been privileged to know. Some of what you see may surprise you, because this China is in the midst of a profound social and economic change. I will show you a country that is both ancient and new. 20th century ideas living side by side with 5,000 years of history and tradition. And I'll introduce you to some of my friends who are experiencing firsthand a major transition in their lives. It is important for us to know about the Chinese because what happens to one quarter of the human race eventually affects all of us. They have never been closer to us than right now. So join me on my journey through a changing China. This is Guilin. They call it the most beautiful place between heaven and earth. Guilin is my hometown. We Chinese have a very special feeling for the place where we were born and where our ancestors are buried, a sense of belonging and continuity. My parents met and married here, and I love coming back as often as I can. It is a landscape Chinese painters and writers have made famous throughout the world. 1,500 years ago, a poet wrote, the river forms a green silk belt, the mountains are like jade hairpins. Guilin's River Li meanders through the dreamlike landscape of Guangxi province in southwestern China. It winds its way around improbable limestone towers and tropical bamboo forests. Carved by wind and water for over 300 million years, these legendary mountains once rested at the bottom of the sea. The town of Guilin gets its name from the Gui trees. In fact, Guilin means forest of Gui trees. Every October, the air is filled with the delicate fragrance of gui flowers. It is an intoxicating scent I'll always associate with my childhood. Here in Guilin, fishermen for centuries have used cormorants to catch their prey. The special bond between the bird and his master has been developed over many years. Strings are placed around the cormorant's neck to keep the bird from swallowing its catch. And at twilight, the fishermen on their bamboo rafts encircle a small section of the river and begin an ancient choreography of sound and movement. The light from the lanterns attracts the fish and the cormorants, with noisy encouragement from their masters, do the rest. Mm -hmm. 
Guilin I left as a child was a small, sleepy town. The Guilin I returned to is busy and thriving, with over four million visitors last year. Now that official permission to travel is no longer necessary for the Chinese, they have become the biggest group of tourists in their own land, and Guilin has always been their favorite spot. That the Chinese people have more money and the freedom to spend it is apparent in a small town like Guilin, and even more so in the big cities. It's early morning in Shanghai, and China's largest city and busiest port is coming alive. Located on the Huangpu River, Shanghai is truly the Big Apple of China. Along the river bank, people gather for their Tai Chi exercises. It's a ritual that begins before daybreak. Many adjourn to nearby food stores for breakfast before heading off to work. Shanghai, with its population of 12 million, has always been a cosmopolitan city, the commercial hub of China. All around us are reminders of the past, of the city's early role as an international trading port and a leader in China's industrial development. Shanghai hasn't had an easy past. It survived the Japanese occupation, social and economic upheaval, and more recently, the devastating effects of the Cultural Revolution. But the Shanghainese are a people with a very special spirit. And now in the 80s, they have once again become the trendsetters. Shanghai today is buzzing with a new feeling of sophistication and energy. And the open door policy initiated by former leader Deng Xiaoping is largely responsible for these changes flood of consumerism has recharged modern China. In the walk fast, talk fast environment of a free marketplace, Shanghai has become a paradise for China's new breed of entrepreneurs. And with money to spend, the Shanghainese are buying. What you are seeing is the daily opening rush of number one department store, the largest store in China. It may look like a sale, but it isn't. Prices are fixed by the state. There are no sales, exchanges, or refunds. Almost half a million shoppers pass through these aisles each day, and many come from other parts of China. Weddings are a major time for spending. It's fashionable for brides to have as part of their dowry what are known as the three wheels, a sewing machine, and a bicycle, the three noises, a transistor radio, TV, and a washing machine, and the 36 legs, a dining table with six chairs, a couch, and a bed. It used to be that clothes were worn for nine years. Three years is new, three years is old, and three years is patched up. But today, the Chinese government is encouraging consumerism, and fashion is the thing. Shanghai has been called the Paris of China. If they are wearing it here today, they will want copies of it in Nanjing and Beijing tomorrow. It has also been called the Hollywood of China. The Shanghai Film Studio, China's oldest, has produced many of the country's major motion pictures. This city is a place where deals are struck and profits are made. Over the years, it's acquired the image of a wild and wicked town, filled with street smart businessmen. I asked the mayor, Jiang Ziming, about the city's rather dubious reputation. Foreign businessmen always say Shanghainese are shrewd. They are hard to do business with. But I say if you want a partner to do business with, who would you prefer? Somebody who's smart or somebody who's foolish? Of course, you will go with the smart one. In the 19th century, Shanghai was divided into foreign concessions controlled by the British, French and Americans. 
the foreigners made the Shanghainese second-class citizens in their own land. But there is a part of the city never touched by foreigners known as Old Town. The area was once surrounded by a moat and an imposing wall built to keep invaders out. Most of the wall is gone now, but the past still lives on here. A popular attraction in Old Town is Hu Xingting, which literally means pavilion in the middle of the lake. It houses shops, snack bars, restaurants, and tea houses. Dim sum is another popular food item here. It's as much fun to watch it be made as it is to eat. There are those who fear cultural pollution from the West. They say, don't open the doors and windows because flies and insects will come into China. But Deng Xiaoping says, open the doors and windows, breathe in the fresh air, and we'll take care of the flies and insects. There may be some unwanted capitalist flies in Shanghai, and some spiritual pollution from the West. But Shanghai wasn't exactly a model city to begin with. With its huge population, it's a crowded, low-rise, walk-up urban planner's nightmare. The congested streets make Manhattan look calm. And yet the Shanghainese love it here. In Shanghai, there's a saying that goes, I would prefer to have just a bed in the heart of the city than to have a whole suite of rooms in the country. In a downtown Beijing restaurant, customers are watching gun smoke in Chinese. There are over 100 million TV sets in China, and over 400 million people are watching at any one time. China uses TV as a tool to inform and educate, and the government has made low-cost black and white TV sets available to everyone. And one of the things they see these days is commercials helping to fuel the new economy. From fast food duck to this one for Tian Fu Cola. But this family isn't watching commercials. They are watching my program, One World. One World is the first Chinese television series ever produced and hosted by a foreigner. It's aired twice a week in English and Mandarin. Hello, I'm Yusai Khan. China Daily credits One World for giving China a global perspective indispensable to its modernization. I even introduced them to Kermit the Frog. Ni hao, everybody! <laughs> Kermit, you speak Chinese! Well, just a little tiny, tiny there bit. other Western programs on Chinese TV, movies, sports, and Donald Duck. Here he is with the Monkey King, a popular figure in Chinese mythology. He's saying, Uncle Donald, I would like to invite you to my house for Peking Duck. China's new open-door policy means more contact with foreigners. Everywhere we went, we heard Chinese speaking English. Quite a change from the 50s and 60s, when it was chic in China to speak Russian. Today, English is taught as the most important second language. What color is your shirt? My shirt is white. Okay. What color? The secondary school we visited in Guilin teaches English to all students from the seventh grade on. Very, very good. You have learned the teacher is from New Zealand, one of hundreds of foreign experts invited to come to work in China. Like to read for us. Give Sandy that shot. Give Sandy that coat. Give Sandy those trousers. Give Sandy those socks. One thing you must remember. Do you remember? Yeah. yeah. First time I came back to China as an adult was 15 years ago. Coming from America, nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. Anti-American posters were everywhere. Revolutionary songs blasted on every street corner. There was tension on the faces of people. Even my own uncle refused to see me for fear he might get into trouble with the Chinese government. But in today's China, the people are quite different.
They are warm, open, curious about the outside world. And they have opinions. Oh, sorry, I don't agree. I don't agree. On Sunday mornings in parks all over China, hundreds of people gather to practice their conversational English and to talk with foreigners. Today there is a great thirst for knowledge and for success. I want to continue my study as the business administration. Uh, and I can do what I want to do. Uh, I'm studying international finance. Um, when I graduate, I want to be a lawyer as a private. Most of the Chinese uh, college students, when they graduate, they want to find a good job. The earlier you could get rich, the like more glorious. If I pass it, I can go abroad, go America. The most important thing uh, for our young people to go abroad is not to study their cultures, I think. Most important thing is to study their technology. The American people always divorce, you see? Divorce maybe 50%. But in China it's quite different, I think. But there's no problem with divorce. What's wrong with divorce? If you could not get along with a wife, why just, why just uh, no, lie no. on bed with, your, with the wife who has no, you have no interest, you have no desire? In China, most uh, young people and students uh, don't believe traditional Marxism in any case. They believe, I think, new ideas from the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think the old ideas is, is bad. I just want to take the good things from both. I read a book, it is said in America, government is like rubbish, rubbish. I read, I read in a book. <laughs> Some people tell me, don't talk about government in the US. Government cares nobody. Is that true? I read in a book. Whether the young people want to hold on to traditional Chinese values or not, it's clear that Western influences are part of this changing China. And I still believe in the bright future. You know, I still have a dream anyway. <laughs>
started by the government in 1978, local people rent space and sell their produce for personal profit. Products like this spicy roasted chicken are particularly hot items. Competition is fierce and those who offer the best product win. Store after store selling the same thing and yet this couple seemed to be doing the most business. The woman in charge told me that their chickens sell for 4 yuan or just over a dollar per pound. On a good day, her profit is about 12 dollars, which is very good money. Then there was this shepherd I encountered near a section of the Great Wall. He had been on the road for four days, driving his sheep on foot from his home in Inner Mongolia to sell in Beijing. He reckoned this herd of over 200 sheep would bring a nice profit, since each sheep could sell for as much as $18. I saw examples of this kind of individual enterprise all over China. This village called Qibao is located about 100 miles west of Shanghai in southern China. Three generations often live together under one roof. Peasants in China live in cluster housing. The land is owned by the state and it leases individual plots of land for families to cultivate. As rent, the farmers deliver a set quantity of grain or other crops to the state at a fixed price. Beyond this, Farmers can now use their land to grow and sell anything they want at the free market. The atmosphere at the market is bustling and lively. And why not? These people know that the money they're making will actually go into their own pockets and end up buying them valued items like televisions and refrigerators. In China, unlike other developing countries, there is much less of a population shift to the cities because farmers are now able to work in industries in their own communities. It is interesting that this crocheting being done at home is actually commissioned by a Japanese company. Yet with all these economic changes, something stay the same. Cabbage, for instance. Although there's an increasing variety of vegetables available, northern Chinese still consume an outrageous amount of cabbage. In the late fall, a family begins to hoard away as much as 400 pounds, a throwback to the old days when cabbage was the only vegetable available in the long winter months. It may be a China in transition, but the old ways die hard. Thank you.